Chapter Twelve of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Expedition to Explore San Lucas. The northern part of the chain of mountains between the River Cauca and the Magdalena had generally been considered rich in orchids but up to the present few or none with a knowledge of plants had entered into the hills from the magdalena side the cauca side of this chain of mountains is the home of the famous odontoglossum harianum all the information i could gather about the eastern side of the range was that the colombian merchants messrs lopez and navarro had sent an expedition two years before to explore these mountains in search of gold at great risk and expense employing many men they had penetrated to the highest point in the northern part of the range a high peak called la tete de san lucas which is a barren rock on the top of a mountain something like eight thousand feet above sea level i was determined to follow in their track knowing that if i reached this altitude i should have passed through every zone of vegetation in the northern part of this range i accordingly started in a canoe from a port on the banks of the magdalena called badillo it was necessary to cross over to the western bank and follow an arm of the river our object being to reach a small village called simiti situated at the foot of the mountains but on the edge of a large lake called lake simiti we followed the course of the river magdalena for half a day and then took a more westerly course entering the mouth of a canal which drains the lake this canal is very narrow and in some parts only admits of two canoes passing each other the vegetation on each side is like that of the rest of the valley of the magdalena being most luxuriant and this part of the forest is full of game especially the taper and the capybara while the branches of the trees are hung with egrets large blue and white cranes and kingfishers another half day brought us to lake simiti it is a novel sight to emerge out of a narrow channel walled in on each side by thick forest into a magnificent sheet of water twelve miles long and seven miles broad ornamented with several islands each one covered with a wealth of tropical palms while on one side of the lake the slopes of the andes shelve down to the water's edge and the towering peaks of the central range form the line of the horizon sunset here is a glorious sight the colored rays of light seem to rush down the mountain side and gild the waters of the lake sometimes creating a sort of mirage in which the forests of the andes are represented with crowns of active volcanoes about four hours paddling in the canoe brought us to the village this is at present but a miserable collection of mud huts in the time of the spaniards it was a rich and thickly populated town but now all that remains of its former greatness are some two or three stone houses and two churches which neither climate nor revolution has been able to affect one of them which i photographed is a good specimen of the early spanish church in this country history says the origin of the riches of this town were the gold mines of the vicinity which yielded immense wealth to their spanish owners but when spain lost her power in colombia many of these mines were either lost or purposefully filled up and it is only lately that efforts are being made to discover these rich veins again a large quantity of fine gold is annually washed out of various creeks and rivers by the natives who use a flat wooden dish the situation of this town is excellent placed as it is on the edge of so fine a lake which swarms with fish and myriads of waterfowl the natives have no need for manual labor as the lake and the forest provide them with all the necessaries of life here i was obliged to obtain men to carry provisions to the woods as from here to the highest point reached by the expedition of captain lopez is nine days journey on foot and except for a few provisions to be obtained at the mines now being worked in the mountains i was told that very little was to be had to eat the first day's track ran through a kind of scrub and pasture land which form the slopes of the hills and along the side of the track there are sugar and coffee plantations 
the second day was much the same but the third day we had left all trace of habitation and struck into the thick forest the principal living things i saw here being some wild turkeys and crowds of toucans i suppose the track was made through the forest according to the caprice of the director of the expedition for to keep in the track in about three miles of distance we were obliged to cross a serpentine kind of river nine times always wading above our knees on the banks of this river i found many lovely specimens of oncidium cramerianum but i did not stop to collect it from a desire to know what there was on the higher grounds at the end of the third day we had ascended something like three thousand feet and on the morning of the fourth we arrived at the gold mines called la concepcion the property of messrs lopez and navarro where the director mr thomas smallfield treated us with the greatest kindness although a miner's life in the wilds of the andes must necessarily be full of privations every one seemed happy and contented we rested here one day and after being furnished with a few necessaries by our friends the miners we again started on the track two years had elapsed since the expedition passed that way and then the road made was a mere trail with the rank growth of vegetation in these climates this track had become entirely overgrown messrs lopez and navarro believed that since the time of the spaniards no one had set foot in these mountains but themselves and judging from the wildness of the rank virgin forest what they say must be correct although i had one of the most expert guides who had taken part in the first expedition we were continually losing ourselves often having to branch out turn back or even climb trees to find the direction of the track the mountains on this side of the magdalena differ from the orchid grounds in the eastern range in being thickly covered with immense timber trees of great height and thickness while those on the eastern side are often only covered with a miserable scrub it would be impossible to describe the peculiar undulations and deviations of the top of this range of mountains not a quarter of a mile being level first we would descend some thousand feet letting ourselves down by creepers and shrubs as best we could at the peril of our lives from a fall or from the deadly coral snakes which lurked on the shelves of the rocks sometimes scrambling along the bed of some mountain stream then again we would climb with our packs of provisions another quarter of a mile almost perpendicularly often on our hands and knees always with the one object of reaching the highest point of the range in order by so doing to pass through every variety of vegetation it was important for us to camp each night where we found water for instance if we came to a stream about four o'clock in the afternoon we must not leave it for fear darkness set in before we could find another two nights we were greatly inconvenienced by the side of the mountain being so steep that we were obliged to cut down a tree and lodge it lengthwise against two others then place our feet firmly against the horizontal tree and so pass the night in a reclining position the tree keeping us from sliding down the mountain side the journey from the mine to the top of san lucas occupied six days of the hardest toil i have ever experienced and when we reached the height our provisions were well nigh exhausted we had seen but few wild turkeys the only living thing to be found in plenty being colonies of large black monkeys which sat in the high trees grinning at us as we went past the palms on some of the highest hills were torn up by the roots and split into shreds by the powerful black bears which however did not trouble us of orchids there was a considerable variety ranging from the epidendrums of the arid plains to the sobralias and masdevallias of the cold regions but the principal wealth of vegetation is in the variety of anthuriums tropical ferns and other fine foliage plants in one of the streams we almost lost ourselves in a perfect forest of alocasias some of these having a stem a foot in circumference and reaching a height of twenty feet there were here also some very lovely plants i had not seen before of the family of the gesneras besides climbers flowering shrubs and selaginellas 
The return journey to Simiti cost us seven days. Everyone arrived in good health, no one having suffered much apparently from our seventeen days camping in the forest. I may say, for the encouragement of anyone who may choose to explore these mountains, whether in search of gold or plants, or whatever it may be, that the natives here are the most trustworthy and the most enduring of fatigue of any I have met with. Those who went with me carried a heavy pack all day, climbing over the most inaccessible tracks, and at night preparing our camp, often under the greatest difficulty, the forest as a rule being dripping wet and the wood saturated. Our bread was procured by taking a bag of maize meal with us, and every night one of the men made excellent cakes, enough to serve for the next day's consumption. We had only one pot of any size, and it was a terrible blow to the community when the man who carried it fell down a precipice, his pack landing at the bottom first, and smashed our only means of making broth. Everyone in the vicinity was loud in his praise of a part of the Magdalena adjoining what is known as the Santo Domingo River. So I determined to pay a visit to this district, and I can assure anyone coming after me that I was not disappointed. In Simiti the canoe is as indispensable to everyone as a horse is to the gaucho, and the journey to the Santo Domingo, about fifty miles, is made by winding about amongst the various channels and small streams which cut up the immense savannas on the west bank of the Magdalena. The river Santo Domingo, after rushing down from the mountainside in the form of a noisy rivulet, suddenly gathers great force as it reaches the level land, and then, with the help of two small tributaries it receives, forms the only supply of four large lakes. It was near the borders of one of these lakes I took up my abode with a family of natives for a short time, with a view to exploring the forest on each side of the higher waters of the river, and also with the object of securing some specimens of the curious waterfowl, etc., to be found around the edges of the lake. The plains forming this side of the Magdalena are something like one hundred miles wide from the river to the foot of the chain of mountains. These plains are called by the natives La Savanas de San Luis. The land is very flat, mostly thick forest, sometimes intersected with swamp, in other parts with immense prairies, where the rank grass gives shelter to large herds of peccaries, as well as to the tapir, jaguar, and puma. These plains are very scantily inhabited, the scattered natives living at a great distance from each other. Sometimes a family will have a ten-mile range of savanna for the few cattle they possess. The settlement where I lived was made up of three families, and in a southerly direction our nearest neighbors were at least seventy miles distant. The houses in which the natives live, although much superior to many Indian huts, are still very temporary. In fact, they have no need of substantial dwellings, as they leave the low plains on the approach of the rainy season and migrate to higher ground. Animals of every kind become particularly daring here. They seem well aware they have little to fear from the indolent natives. The fat, unwieldy alligators, which elsewhere will generally shuffle into the water to hide themselves on the approach of any one, here fight for the refuse food thrown into the river from the huts of the station. The jaguars and pumas, which have the reputation of being cowardly, are, on the contrary, a continual source of annoyance to the settlers, often making great havoc among the cattle, so much so that everything likely to serve as food for them must be driven into an enclosure made of stout poles for the night. The jaguar, or as the natives call it, the tiger, often succeeds, however, in breaking through and taking away some dainty morsel in the form of a calf or a goat. The month of March is the time when the jaguars are most troublesome, and this happened to be the period at which I was on the savannas. In this month the turtles come out of the water during the night to deposit their eggs in the sandbanks, and the jaguars, actuated by some peculiar instinct, leave the more distant forests and live on the banks of the lakes, or in the vicinity. Although the turtles are both cunning and swift, hundreds of them annually fall a prey to the stealthy jaguar, 
which loses no time in scooping out every particle of flesh contained in its horny shell, but still without breaking it open. This they succeed in doing by inserting their powerful claws into the natural opening at each end of the shell. Every night while I lodged in the huts on the Santo Domingo, we were disturbed by the roaring of the jaguars. Sometimes one would howl all night close to us, occasionally two, and even three would call to each other from different parts of the lakeside or the forest. The male and female are easily distinguishable by their roar. In their natural state in the woods, the call of the female being more prolonged and shrill than that of the male. I determined to try to rid ourselves of one or more of these unwelcome visitors. There were only two natives, however, in the settlement who were able to help me in a jaguar hunt, but we had plenty of dogs. The night before the proposed hunt we noticed well the situation of the beasts, as the natives know that the place where they howl at midnight is where they may be sought for at daybreak. We started away while it was dark, taking with us the best dogs of the settlement, and arrived on the edge of the lake where we expected to find our game just as the first streaks of dawn were appearing. It was evident by the signs of the dogs that the jaguars had been prowling around, but we were obliged to wait for more light. Very soon the deep footprints in the sand showed us in what direction to go, and half a mile of careful tracking around the edge of the lake brought us in sight of the jaguar. Then we dodged in amongst the bushes, keeping ourselves and the dogs as much under cover as possible, until by making a short cut we came down upon the beautiful animal at a distance of not more than twenty yards. It eyed us curiously for a moment, then went off with a peculiar motion like the action of a horse trotting. But we had the dogs in full cry at once. The jaguar went straight for the thick forest but did not go far before the dogs came up with it, when it turned on its haunches and prepared to fight. It was wise for us to keep at a safe distance, to avoid the now infuriated animal springing upon us, and it was difficult to shoot for fear of hitting the dogs. After ten minutes of desperate fighting, the jaguar made a bound for the nearest tree, where it was out of the way of the dogs. I aimed a ball at the heart, but only broke the shoulder. However, this brought it again to the ground, and, mad with pain, it made a desperate spring at one of the natives, and came very near strangling him, bearing him to the ground with the force of the spring. It was a critical moment for my companion, and had the jaguar been still unwounded, instead of having a broken leg, it would probably have been the death of the native. While the mad beast was doing its best to clutch the neck of the prostrate Indian, I aimed a ball which struck the brain, and the sleek, beautiful animal rolled over motionless. It was a male, a fine specimen, measuring seven feet six inches from the nose to the tip of the tail. As we killed it in the thick jungle, where it was difficult to photograph, there was no alternative but to carry it on our shoulders to the edge of the lake, where we could get a good light. One of the Indians was so injured as to be unable to help in this operation, so I shouldered one end of the pole, being determined not to lose the chance of a picture. As soon as this had been satisfactorily accomplished, we were not long in taking off the skin, and this finished our adventure with the jaguar for this time, although by no means the only one. Anyone looking at the adjoining picture may be puzzled to know how the photograph was taken under the circumstances. Nearly all these pictures have been made with Messrs. Roach's patent camera, I set the instrument in a position which I knew would produce the desired picture, and then instructed one of the natives to touch the spring which exposes the plate, this plate being carried away and developed at a more convenient time. An instance will illustrate how the turkey buzzards and the vultures do their work in taking the place of scavengers. At the time we killed the jaguar, not a bird was to be seen in the sky. But before we had taken off the skin, at least a hundred vultures were wheeling overhead, and by evening a few scattered bones were all that remained of our game. End of chapter 12 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina
Chapter 13 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spoonbills. The waterfowl which congregate around the shores of these lakes in the months of March and April are to be found in such numbers that the description becomes almost incredible i have seen at a rough calculation over four thousand in one flock which extend themselves over a mile of the shallow water or sandbank the most conspicuous amongst them are the immense storks the micteria americana which stand five feet high and look like soldiers with scarlet necks it is very rarely the natives succeed in shooting one but when they do quite a feast is made as they consider the flesh very good besides these a smaller stork is to be seen in much larger numbers then come the blue herons the large white cranes the egrets two or three varieties of bitterns a crowd of large muscovy ducks a line of the awkward birds called the shag the snake-necked diver and two kinds of small ducks which to say are represented by hundreds would give but a poor idea of the cloud they make as they rise in the air although most of them are migratory and few of them breed in this part yet they are remarkably tame having nothing to disturb them but an occasional passing canoe and they remain stationary long enough for any one to get a good sight of them and even a photograph amongst the many varieties the bird which seemed to me the most curious as well as the most strikingly beautiful is what is known as the roseate spoonbill platelia ajaja it is about the size of a small goose and finds its food in the soft mud and sand by digging up grubs and worms with its odd shaped bill the feathers are of a lovely rose pink color deepening into scarlet in the tail and a band of the same color runs across the wings the peculiar satin-like texture greatly adds to their beauty i succeeded in obtaining some five hundred specimens of birds of many species in this locality on account of the flatness of the land orchids are somewhat scarce around the shores of the lakes the most conspicuous of any note is the epidendrum atropurpureum album and as it flowers here clinging to the bare trunks of the trees it is a glorious sight the spikes are long crowded with flowers and of the most distinct colors not pale and washy as is often the case in cultivation sometimes it grows in clumps which perfume the air for a distance around although the santo domingo river is only navigable for about three days journey in a canoe it was necessary to fit up something like an expedition so as to be able to explore more effectually the mountains beyond my former privations in the san lucas district had made me cautious enough not to start into an unknown country without provisions but here we found later that we wanted very little more than the woods provided in this locality there is such an abundance of fish and game that a tribe of indians could support themselves for three months abandoned banana plantations are to be found at intervals along the banks of the rivers still growing and bearing fruit with as much luxuriance as when the native owners cultivated them years before further up the river we found orange trees laden with hundreds of luscious fruit while the breadfruit artocarpus incisa is a common timber tree growing in profusion all over the lower lands this would provide wagon loads of its immense fruit if there were a demand for it besides in the season when the mangoes are ripe tons of the fruit are wasted these with the bread fruit provide the means of living for herds of wild pigs and tapers which swarm the forest as we journeyed up the river through the floating limnocaris and pontederias we came to another lake about six miles long the thick forest coming right to the water's edge made it very beautiful a company of natives had taken up fishing quarters here for a week or two to lay in a stock of fish for the winter and a description of their means of catching them may be interesting the kind of fish most sought after and which abounds the most 
is the Pimelotus tigrinus or catfish which often attains a very large size the natives go out in canoes provided with about half a dozen harpoons which are made in two sections a sharp barbed piece of iron is fixed to a piece of wood about two inches long and this piece with the barb fits into a socket made in the end of a stout rod the barb piece is further attached to the long shaft by a stout cord the native as he moves about the river or lake in his canoe makes a thumping noise to disturb the fish this brings them to the top of the water and their size and the velocity with which they swim make stream enough for the native who stands in the prow of the canoe to discern them the moment he gets a good sight of the position of the fish he throws the harpoon with an aim that very rarely fails the moment the fish is struck it darts off across the lake at a terrific speed the barbed part of the harpoon detaches itself from the socket in the long shaft by the force of the water but still remains connected with the canoe by the cord the native then pursues the fish until it becomes exhausted and sometimes the chase is most exciting when the fish is so tired as to allow him to come up with it it is knocked on the head with a cutlass and taken into the boat large quantities are annually caught by this means in the dry season and cut into long strips to be salted for provisions for the time of floods in the rainy season the only way that the natives can catch fish in the deep water is to shoot them with arrows when they rise to the surface to bask in the sun this party of natives had already gathered together several hundred weight of fish and as one company leaves the lakes it is succeeded by another all through the dry season as we kept on up the river i saw several clumps of trees laden with a beautiful oncidium splendidum hung and trailing on the branches looking quite a forest of orchids their long spikes of bright yellow flowers appearing like a golden cloud in the tops of the tall timber trees a peculiar chamberchia i did not know was growing here curious looking enough with its pale green flowers and long mossy roots the natives use the sap of the bulbs as gum for their cigars the long rolls of tobacco which every one smokes are first made up from the leaves and then the end is finished by sticking it with a little of the sap of this chamberchia most of the indian huts have two or three old squaws who are adepts at this and thus every hut has its own private tobacco manufactory apart from its utility in this respect the plant has not merit enough to warrant it being brought to england except as a botanical curiosity some of the trees which hung over the stream were laden with a pink-flowered epidendrum one of the paniculatum section the branches being so heavy with the weight of the plants as to bend into the water i found a variety of bird here trogan viridis i had not seen before in the lowlands the breast of this species instead of being scarlet or rose-colored like most of its fellows is a steel blue the back of a shiny green and the under part of the body yellow i have found the same bird at an altitude of five thousand feet myself and my native helpers have had many adventures with snakes from the delicate whip snake to the mighty boa which every living thing in the forest flees from and leaves master an incident that happened here is curious enough to be worth mentioning one evening i went for a stroll in the forest while the natives were preparing supper some small birds known as red-winged starling lystes guianensis were flitting about i shot one which fell from the tree still alive and fluttering before i had time to catch it a large black and white snake known to the natives as the hunter sprang from an adjoining hollow tree and seizing the luckless bird was making off into the thicket at a quick pace fortunately one barrel of my shotgun still remained loaded and a snap shot from this stopped its progress just as it was disappearing this occurrence shows how much care is necessary in moving about in the forest seeing how difficult it is to be aware of the presence of these venomous enemies in going up the river an event occurred simple enough in itself but which serves to illustrate how little the native is at a loss for resources under any circumstances 
the canoe in which we travelled was a primitive structure made out of a hollowed tree about thirty feet long but very narrow in this we travelled very swiftly where the water was smooth but to begin to move about in it when it was in motion put us in danger of being thrown into the river the man who had charge of the spoon-like paddle in the stern of the boat wanted to smoke but had no tobacco his companion in the prow had plenty how to pass a cigar along the length of the craft while in motion appeared to me a difficult question not so to the native his drinking cup a calabash shell was lying beside him without a moment of reflection he placed one of the large rolls of native tobacco in the calabash and dropped it into the water in another moment it had floated downstream and was alongside the native who sat in the stern he coolly lifted the calabash out of the water lighted his roll of tobacco and went on his way rejoicing as we neared the higher waters of the river navigation became more and more difficult and before long we were obliged to tie up our canoe make a kind of camp and prepare to enter the forest on foot the santa domingo river in the part where it runs down the mountain side has always been famous for the quantity and purity of the gold found there the natives have many legends about it as well as about the mountains of san lucas the story most in vogue before the expedition was sent by captain lopez was that the towering stone pinnacle seen from so great a distance was literally a deposit of gold and that the higher part of the mountain was inhabited by some pygmy race of gold diggers many of the men who accompanied the expedition were not a little surprised when they reached the pinnacle to find it nothing but a huge gray rock and some were still more surprised when they were required to sign their names or put their mark to a document to certify what they saw the legend of the santo domingo is that in one of the higher parts of the river a vein of gold was known to the spaniards called by the name of el rosario or the rosary and the natives believe to this day that their spanish captors used to cut pure gold out of the rock with chisels they also believe that at the time of the first revolution the vein was covered up purposely and so lost it is very rarely any one penetrates into this forest but when he does all the natives are on the alert and the principal conversation is as to who shall find el rosario at this altitude food had become considerably more scarce than in the valley and we were very pleased to be able to shoot an occasional wild turkey the noble-looking bird known by the name of the crested curaçao cracks a lector the picture represents the female the male bird being altogether of a glossy black i have found this species in nearly every part of colombia except on the high hills feeding on fruit in the tops of the trees it very rarely comes to the ground i have shot male birds which weighed as much as twelve pounds the flesh when cooked is tender being nearly as good as that of the domesticated turkey the beautiful little rodriguezia secunda grows here in abundance festooning the trees with wreaths of its pretty rose-coloured flowers mixed with comparetia macroplectron and a small variety of trichopilia the vegetation changes as we ascend the mountain side from the thick growth of the vegetable ivory palm Phytelephus macrocarpa to the bamboo and then again to the region of the tree ferns to avoid the work of cutting away through the forest we often kept along the mountain streams one day as i was wading up one of the streams at an altitude of about six thousand feet i came upon that lovely little plant the nertera depressa growing on the tops of stones about half submerged in the cold water but looking green and healthy all covered with its bright red berries i was the more surprised as i had never found it in any other locality and was almost ignorant of its native country in the forests of colombia i have met with four species of toucans at various altitudes here we were besieged by crowds of the large black variety with a golden yellow patch on the breast and the usual awkward bill i had no difficulty in securing a few as specimens we very soon reached the height of the cattleya grounds 
but for any one to get a good collection here it is necessary to camp in the forest and work three weeks with a good company of men the plants are most difficult to carry through the woods to the canoes and they must be taken by way of simiti where it is easy to get wood to make boxes but when they are made another difficulty presents itself the canoes used here are small and not capable of containing more than half a dozen plant boxes each and then there is a great danger of having them thrown into the river by the least carelessness on the part of the boatmen in making the descent of the santa domingo river we came upon a colony of weaver birds cassicus pariscus these attractive little birds live in companies sometimes amounting to several hundreds and they generally choose a high tree quite isolated and there hang their peculiarly made nests to the extremities of the branches which project most from the trunk in a horizontal position i have met with several species all apparently of the same habits the nests of the one i saw on the santo domingo were perfect works of art about two feet long made of the fine dry stems of climbing plants and woven together in a way that would make it difficult to believe they were the work of so small an architect they are narrow at the top and wide at the bottom looking like huge stockings floating in the wind the wide bulging part at the bottom is occupied by a nice bed made of the soft seed covering of the asclepius and in this the female lays two tiny spotted eggs an aperture is left in the top of the nest just large enough for the occupants to pass in and out and at the same time to look like a trap to snakes and other enemies the cleverness with which they use their needle-like beaks in working the twigs and the agility they display in running in and out of their sack-like homes are perfectly wonderful the male bird is of a shiny black with a spot of rich orange on the back the female being scarcely so attractive they seem by their gentle habits to be birds which could be easily tamed and if it were possible to keep them in confinement they would be universal favorites i left this part of the country by way of the village of simiti as the canoes glided dreamily across the beautiful lake the sun just rising over the tops of the distant mountains threw a soft rosy tint on the waters and this with the picturesque islands covered with dark green waving palms made up a scene which is as indelible in the memory of the traveller as it is indescribable to the reader after leaving lake simiti the canoes followed a channel into the river magdalena where they occupied nearly a whole day in going round the point of an immense island in order to arrive at the station bodega central where passengers must wait to meet the steamboats going down the river to the coast i had four whole days to spend here before one would come down a pair of jaguars had been committing nightly depredations on the cattle of the settlement taking away half-grown cows calves pigs and even coming into the streets of the village and making a meal of one of the dogs so to pass the time while waiting for the boat i determined to try a system employed by the indians to take them that is to tie a calf or a young pig to a stake in some open place in the forest and wait in ambush the nights were beautifully light the moon being full and with clear air in this climate it is possible to see well by moonlight so accordingly i fixed upon a situation about half a mile from the village and tied a pig to a stake i then climbed into a luxuriant mango tree preparing my gun with a good charge of ball to be ready for any visitor just at this season the luscious mangoes are ripe and as they ripen they become detached and fall to the ground every night a large quantity fall providing food for the peccaries tapers and the domesticated pigs of the settlement which come through the night to feed upon them the first night nothing came near me but a few of these animals about midnight the jaguar took a pig away from one of the huts i could hear it squeal as it was being borne into the forest the second night i changed my situation this time a fox and several tiger cats came close to me but the jaguar did not appear the nights were lovely i wish it were possible to describe a moonlight night in a tropical forest but this must be experienced to be understood 
the third night several smaller animals visited me and a splendid jaguar crossed the open space where i was hidden i could see the beautiful spots on the skin but i did not fire in hopes that the animal would come nearer to spring upon the bait in this i was disappointed no doubt the quick sense of smell which the jaguar possesses warned him there was danger and i was obliged to take the boat down the river the next day without being able to add another jaguar skin to the nine i already had on the river steamboats it is very difficult to carry orchids safely on account of the space for cargo being in such proximity to the boilers and the heat so intense on arriving at barranquilla many fine specimens in my collection were lost in this i am not alone as every traveller has found that however well his plants are packed and however carefully looked after many much prized specimens that have cost so much labour and hardship to obtain have to be thrown overboard and left to finish rotting in the muddy waters of the magdalena i was fortunate in securing a passage at once by the royal mail company's steamboat essequibo on the journey from barranquilla to the port there was the usual delay and annoyance the only difference being that i was not able to land at a place called savanilla or salgar the shifting sands of the magdalena have filled this up so that vessels cannot come near and another port has been made with a few sheds in a temporary stage further along the coast and this bears the name of puerto colombia it is said that a contract has been entered into with an english company to supply the material and build a substantial pier etc let us hope that it will be completed before any of my readers have to land there end of chapter thirteen recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina Chapter 14 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Board the Essequibo. The Essequibo was not long in weighing anchor, keeping along the coast, bound for the port of Cartagena. As we left in the evening, and the journey is only of a few hours, we found ourselves in the morning opposite this curious old historic port and city. Its substantial towers and immense walls, with their picturesque surroundings of mountains and forts, give it a more imposing appearance from the sea than any other place I have seen in the north of South America. History is so full of accounts of the sieges and battles, the persecution and bloodshed enacted here in the time of the Spaniards and the pirate buccaneers, that it is almost superfluous for me to recount them. Before these wars the entrance to the city for ships was made through either of two beautiful bays, both of which were excellent harbors. One of these is called Boca Chica and the other Boca Grande but as the inhabitants were being continually robbed and murdered by the buccaneers who came in galleys and entered by way of the smaller port boca chica the colonists determined to stop their inroads by filling up the entrance to the harbor this they actually succeeded in doing by means of large stones with an amount of labor which makes the story almost incredible but at the same time destroying their best port this not being sufficient philip the second of spain caused a wall to be built around the city at a cost of fifty-nine millions of gold dollars it is so wide that forty horses can walk abreast on the top of it however that may be neither time nor weapons have been able to damage it much it still stands a fine old monument and a triumph of masonry History says that none of these means were of any use in protecting the people. The bands of robbers continued to pillage the town and take away tons of gold and silver, which annually came from the rich mines in the interior to be shipped to Spain, each invasion witnessing the same scenes of cruelty and carnage. The vessels lay at some distance from the quay, but a landing was easily effected by means of any of the small boats in waiting the water of the bay being generally smooth as glass 
as the time spent here by the royal mail ships is very short we were soon on shore to see as much of the place as the time would allow the houses are most curious looking like a city of forts many of them are spacious and even palatial the massive stone walls are at least four feet thick and the spaces for the windows fitted with strong iron bars they are built round a square open court after the moorish style the heavy doors which form the only entrance reminding one of the old english portculus and though many of them are half ruined and deserted they give an idea of what cartagena must have been in its glory i visited what is called the inquisition building the only one of the kind left in colombia for nearly sixty years after the then despotic power of the romish church had been overthrown it stood empty it is now the residence of a rich citizen and although it was once fitted with instruments of torture and prison cells where hundreds died a miserable death very little remains in the immense building to prove what deeds of horror were enacted within its walls there are two cathedrals one of the time of the early settlers and one modern both beautiful specimens of architecture adorned with the usual extravagant decorations of high-class roman catholic places of worship in the oldest of these is located the famous marble pulpit the story told about it by the people reads more like a romance than sober fact the tale has it that one of the popes who wanted to present the faithful at cartagena with something to perpetuate his memory and at the same time to adorn the magnificent cathedral ordered the pulpit to be designed and sculptured by the very best artists of the day in rome when the work was finished it was placed on board a spanish galley and dispatched to cartagena in the course of the voyage the vessel was captured by pirates and the boxes containing the pulpit upon being broken open and found to be of no value as plunder were thrown overboard but by the interposition of the virgin none of the pieces sank the english pirates becoming alarmed at the miracle of the heavy marble floating on the water fled from the ship leaving their booty the spanish sailors got the precious cargo aboard their vessel again with great difficulty and continued on their way but before they reached cartagena they encountered a second lot of pirates who plundered them of all their valuables and burned the ship however the saints still preserved the pulpit for as the vessel and the remainder of the cargo were destroyed the carved marble floated away upon the surface of the water and being guided by an invisible hand went ashore on the beach outside the city to which it was destined there it lay for many years unknown and unnoticed finally it was discovered by a party of explorers who recognizing the value of the carvings took it aboard their ship en route for spain intending to sell it when they reached home but the saints still kept their eyes upon the pope's offering and sent the vessel such bad weather that the captain was compelled to put into the port of cartagena for repairs there he told the story of the marble found upon the beach and it reached the ears of the archbishop his grace sent for the captain and informed him that the pulpit was intended for the decoration of the cathedral and related the story of its construction and disappearance the captain did not seem inclined to believe the story but offered to sell the marble and would not leave it otherwise having repaired the damage done by the storm the captain started for europe but he was scarcely out of the harbor when a most frightful gale struck him and wrecked his vessel which went to the bottom with all on board but the pulpit the subject of so many divine interpositions rose from the wreck and one morning came floating into the harbor of cartagena where it was taken in charge by the archbishop and placed in the cathedral for which it was intended and where it now stands the story may be taken for what it is worth but one thing is undeniable the quality and variety of the marble used and the richness and beauty of the sculpture must give it a place among the first objects of art in the world besides the many rare and costly altarpieces and carvings to be seen here there is one object so curious as to be worthy of a special remark this is the preserved body of a saint 
I do not remember whether any name is affixed to the coffin, but the story says he was a great favorite with the people of Cartagena, and when he died they asked as a favor that the Pope would allow his body to be embalmed and sent to their church, and there it is to this day. The saint is placed in a glass coffin, which stands upon a marble pedestal. The body is somewhat shriveled, but not, as one noted writer has irreverently put it, like jerked beef. Some have described the body as a hideous spectacle, but I saw nothing repulsive about it. The saint appears to have been a man of middle height, and as the body lies there, it is clad in a coat of ancient mail with a sword and other accoutrements. After leaving the cathedral, I wandered about the old city, admiring the many beautiful statues and the curious masonry until the Essequibo was ready to sail. Formerly the city was connected with the river Magdalena by a ship canal. This still exists, but it is very much filled up by the forest encroachment, and in the dry season it is almost impassable. In leaving the harbor again we got another sight of the wonderful fortifications. The massive walls of the city are, to all appearances, impregnable, and the ancient passages or covered ways leading outward to the foot of the adjacent mountains are still visible, while the sides of the magnificent harbor are studded with grim forts, which, though now unused for more than half a century, seem almost as good as new. Our next port of call was Cologne, so famous for being the entrance to the Panama Canal from the Atlantic side. This is only a few hours' sail from Cartagena along the rugged Colombian coast, passing on the way the Indian Territory and the Gulf of Darien. The scenery is wild and beautiful, and the harbor of Cologne is considerably more attractive from the sea than on shore, although there is the advantage if it may be called one, of the ship lying alongside the wharf, yet the change from the romantic surroundings of Cartagena to the more modern filth and disorder of Cologne is anything but agreeable. With the colossal project of uniting the two great oceans came what appears to be the scum of all nations, if one may form an opinion by looking into the American bars, Chinese drinking shops, and gambling hells, which seem to leave no room for any settled comfort or the formation of a regular community. The houses had nearly all been built of wood, in the most matchbox style it is possible to imagine, before the last fire. The ground floor was a kind of open shed which supported several flats, and each of these flats was divided into honeycomb-like sections, each section occupied by a family or part of one. The number of people and the numerous nationalities at one time crowded into these small rooms is almost incredible. Such a strange and cosmopolitan company as is to be seen in the streets of Cologne is rarely to be met with. A large percentage of the laborers are Negroes. There are also hordes of Chinese, a few Arabs, and coolies, a company of Frenchmen, a few English and Americans, Spaniards, Cubans, and Colombians, and occasionally a band of half-civilized Indians from the interior may be seen moving about amongst the stores, making purchases, always in company. Here everything has an air of neglected dissipation, and the motto of Jew and Gentile seems to be either to kill themselves with rum or make a fortune. The place has suffered very much from fire, having been twice almost entirely swept away. The part of the town adjoining the entrance to the canal is called the Quatre Francais. An avenue of coconut palms, which were planted some years ago, now form a pretty and an agreeable shade. In this neighborhood are situated the houses of the Frenchmen employed in directing the work of the canal. They are neat little cottages, built of wood and provided with a veranda, where the new imports from Paris can swing in their hammocks, and contemplate the ocean or sunny France on the distant other side. Just at the point of the entrance to the canal, two spacious wooden houses have been built for the use of the famous engineer, M. Ferdinand de Lesseps, while in front of these, on the very edge of the water, is placed a beautiful bronze statue of Christopher Columbus protecting an Indian. This was presented to Cologne by the Empress Eugenie in the time of her power. 
although at the time we passed cologne the actual work of the canal was suspended for want of capital the seven miles already open for traffic were busy with boats and small steamers while the sides were stocked with machinery and workshops as the royal mail ships lie here three or four days travellers have time to take the train across the isthmus to the town of panama the pacific entrance to the canal in the journey a good idea may be formed of the work of excavating which is being done and the scenery is good while the town is very much more commodious than cologne at cologne we were obliged to transship to the homeward bound mail the steamship tagus everyone being sorry to leave the excellent and kindly captain of the essequibo captain buckley the tagus was soon on its way to jamaica the mosquitoes and the bad climate together with the filth and disorder of cologne made everyone glad that the stay here was not longer so much has been written from time to time about the beautiful island of jamaica that there is no need here for me to do more than merely mention the port sailing along the coast we soon come in sight of the shallows and the jutting projection with the fortifications called port royal as the waves dash up on the sandy beach the strong light of this climate gives the water a most lovely transparent blue color which is seldom seen in more northern latitudes kingston harbor is one of the most important in the west indian islands and is always well filled with ships of every kind and nation from the magnificent modern man-of-war and merchant ship to the tiny sailboat that trades along the coast with fruit the appearance of this island from the sea is very much improved by a range of hills which extends the whole length of the interior they are very rightly called the blue mountains as they are mostly covered with a thin mist which looks from the sea like a pale blue gauze thrown over them changing with the rays of the sun to the most fantastic colors as the ships lie alongside the quay passengers are at liberty to stroll on shore to visit the places of interest in the town of kingston some take apartments in hotels to avoid the uncomfortable heat of the ship others make excursions to various parts of the island the town itself although full of business activity is hot and dusty the most favorite resorts in the country are the lovely model botanical gardens which occupy one of the best situations half a day's journey up the blue mountains and the military station which lies far up the side of the mountain where the air is cool and pure last year the exhibition of manufactured goods and products of the islands was a great attraction to kingston tram cars run to one of the suburbs called constant spring about an hour's ride from kingston passing on the way many pretty villas in which the wealthy inhabitants of the town take refuge from business a commodious hotel has been built at this place offering every convenience for visitors the beautiful park called the victoria park is rich with a wealth of tropical plants which every foreigner covets the keeping and arrangement of the plants are carried out with the greatest good taste although a large part of the island is mountainous and uncultivated there are many fine sugar estates and the growing of sugar cane and making of sugar and rum occupy most of the labor of the island every variety of tropical fruit is in lavish abundance especially pineapples many of which find their way to the london market some of the oncidiums grow in profusion in the climate of jamaica many of the cottages have quite a quantity of plants which flower very freely and look extremely pretty although the negroes are generally averse to hard work it would probably be difficult to find a more peaceable law-abiding community than the colored population of the island of jamaica in the country their tiny hovels are little removed from sheds often miserably neglected but in the town many of the houses are furnished with the greatest care and comfort the inhabitants of the outlying hamlets are occupied largely in producing fruit for the market of kingston and in the season of the ripening of the mangoes they seem like the south american indians to subsist almost entirely on this fruit while the pawpaw carica papaya and the avocado pear laurus persia form the dessert 
although many of the streets of kingston are narrow and badly kept the houses are built so as to ensure the greatest comfort to the inhabitants of a hot climate the large airy saloons which are often on the second floor are formed of partitions of lattice-work which exclude largely the dust and insects and at the same time admit of a free circulation of air and so keep the dwellings as cool and agreeable as possible as we had been four days delayed at cologne and two more at jamaica any one having a valuable cargo of plants from the cool regions of the andes would naturally be uneasy about their safety in the roasting heat of these ports so i was only too pleased when we steamed past port royal on our way to the island of haiti the tag is coasted along the island and then put into the harbor of jack mel only to deliver mail and passengers which occupies a very short time the sight from the sea is very picturesque but no one lands here excepting those who have business and however beautiful this island may be very little seems to be known about it to the outside world for my part after the journey thus described i was in no mood to undertake the task the tag is put into the harbor of bridgetown barbados just by way of a call to see our friends and then betook herself to the eleven days journey across the atlantic as a rule the large company of colonials who come on board at the various islands are not the best of sailors and there is the usual period of seasickness to get over but long before we reached the azores every one was on deck enjoying the beautiful passage which continued until we reached the lizard finally we reached the lovely harbor of plymouth where many an exile who had lived a stranger in a strange land was glad enough to again set foot on old england the end end of chapter fourteen end of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter an account of canoe and camp life in columbia while collecting orchids in the northern andes by albert milliken recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina